as a leading provider of P&I cover and other services to the international shipping community. The club insures over 240 million tons of owned and chartered ships. This includes some of the world's largest and most sophisticated designs. We are championing best industry practice and investing in innovation. The UK P&I Club will continue to focus on what it does best. Protecting shipping globally, together. I'm Nicolas Bornos of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you to today's podcast. Welcome to the podcast series, Riding the Waves of a Lifetime. This podcast series gives us the opportunity to discuss with maritime industry leaders who share with us career and life experiences, as well as their insight on the industry's direction, opportunities, and challenges. I would like to thank the UK p &I Club and Thomas Miller for sponsoring today's event and for their support of the industry and specifically for ship safety and security. Today, we have the opportunity to discuss with Dr. Graham Henderson, one of the best known, most respected and most influential people in the maritime sector. Graham is a person who has had significant impact on the development and direction of the industry. Graham has a long and distinguished career in shipping, which would take long to describe in detail, giving it the attention it deserves. So before we start the conversation, I would like to take just a couple of minutes for a brief introduction, focusing on major highlights. Today, Dr. Graham Henderson is the CEO of Together in Safety, a non-regulatory coalition of major shipping industry groups and companies working to improve the safety performance in global shipping to prevent major shipping incidents and save lives. Until the end of July 2021, Graham was formally responsible for sales, global shipping, and maritime activities comprising over 2,000 floating assets, including ships, barges, drilling units, floating production facilities, and related operations. His work spanned sales entire business across upstream, downstream, projects, and construction. Quite a range. Graham is a leading spokesperson on safety and the environment, improving the efficiency of shipping and maritime operations and driving technology and innovation, including digitalization. He was the president of the UK Chamber of Shipping from 2016 to 2018 and president of the Oil Companies International Marine Forum from 2014 to 2018. Previously, a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda and Council on the Oceans, he was appointed by Her Majesty's government to the expert panel for Maritime 2050. He's also an adjunct professor at Southampton University in the UK. Now in 2019, his work in international shipping was recognized by Her Majesty the Queen with the award of the most excellent order of the British Empire, OBE. He has also received many shipping industry awards, including in 2018, the prestigious Safety at Sea Lifetime Achievement Award. Now, previous appointments include the country chair and managing director of Brunei Shell Petroleum, Shell's joint venture company in Brunei, and CIO of Shell's global digital and IT business. Graham has worked for Shell for over 40 years, with some 25 years working overseas on assignments including twice in Brunei, Nigeria, Syria, and three times in the Netherlands. I mean, you can tell quite a lifetime and quite a lot of uh, achievements uh, during his career. So before inviting him to join us, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Graham for the very close and very fruitful cooperation we have had over the years and for his great support. It has been a privilege to work with him uh, and I'm delighted that we have today's podcast. Our discussion today will focus on two or three major themes, a brief trip down memory lane and then focusing on today and looking ahead. 
So let's welcome Graham and start our conversation. Graham, thank you for thank you for being with us today. As I just uh, went through, you have a long, distinguished, and impactful career in shipping. Can you please share with us how did it all start? Well, firstly, um, thank you, Nicholas, for the opportunity to um, be with you today. Um, and where did it all start? Well, I was born in uh, West London. My father was a tailor. Um, it was a small one-person business um, and a small shop. Um, we didn't have any books in the house or anything like that, um, but um, there was enough money, shall I say, that um, we, we could... Um, we could have a, a, a life. Um, really, what I liked was sport and kicking a ball around. Um, I wasn't really interested in school. But one thing that I had was, um, and I don't know where it came from, but a, a talent for uh, mathematics. Um, I seem to add, be able to add quickly columns of numbers and, uh, and things like that. Um, just the same as musicians or singers are born with a talent. So... Um, so I had this talent for mathematics and uh, a teacher at school spotted this. And she also said, well, look, if you're going to get any further, um, you're going to have to improve in some other subjects. So she got me spelling and doing other things. And um, through her help, um, I, I got a place at a good school. I went on to university, the first person ever in my family to go to university. And I studied engineering and mathematics, of course. Um, um, and then the opportunity arose to continue into research. So I um, did a PhD. And of course, um, you'll guess the type, type of thing. So it was 3D mathematical numerical modeling of ocean waves, and particularly their, their impact on coastlines. Um, when I came to the end of that, the, the professor who um, I was working with, he was going to the US to, um, for a sabbatical year. And he said, would I, um, would I do his, his, run his lecture course? Um, so I said yes. And I ran his lecture course for a year. And uh, by golly, um, I, I really realized how you have to know your subject when you're going to teach it. Um, so I had to swat up even more. Um, and at the end of that, I could have stayed on at university very easily. There were lots and lots of opportunities. But it was my father who... Um, um, I think being a small businessman, um, he was a very wise man as well. And he said to me, look, Graham, he said, um, you ought to get a proper job. And um, so um, North Sea Oil was big. Oil and gas was big. Um, I applied to Shell. It was successful. And um, it started all there. I am quite uh, thank you for sharing these details. with them. <laughs> Very, 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 very interesting and very moving. And thank you. So you have been with Shell for over 40 years. Can you describe how your career progressed through Shell and how did you get into shipping from mathematics into shipping? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, Nicholas, I, I, no, I could keep you entertained, everyone entertained for, um, for several hours on my life in Shell. But in summary, um, I started in the UK. Um, people had to start on a sort of a, a graduate training program. So I worked on, uh, on oil platforms. I worked on drilling rigs. I worked on designing new platforms. Um, I worked on a construction site in Scotland for 18 months. Um, and then um, I went to the Netherlands to work in Shell's head office there. And that started the 25 years working abroad. Um, uh, I'd been married just, um, I was getting married and Shell knew that. And just five weeks after getting married, um, we both moved to Brunei, which is on the north coast of Borneo in the Far East. Um, there I headed up the onshore projects, um, the onshore engineering and production for two years. And then I headed up the um, Health, Safety and Environment Group for two years, um, which was a bit of a life-changing moment for me because... Um, I saw a lot in those two years that, um, that, that you know, really moved me uh, and made quite a difference in, in my life. Um, our first baby was just um, eight weeks old when we moved from Brunei to Nigeria, where I was chief engineer, responsible for all of the um, uh, onshore swamp, offshore engineering and production. And uh, 
that was an extremely challenging role, um, a role where I learned an awful lot. Um, lovely people, um, a lovely environment, but a very challenging place to work. Um, two years in, my wife was expecting uh, twin boys and uh, she returned to the UK. Um, the boys were born a couple of weeks earlier, which um, earlier than, than planned, which meant that um, she actually had them supported by her mum. I was in Nigeria and I flew in the next day. Um, we then moved from Nigeria. Uh, my wife's still in the UK. I moved to the Netherlands to um, work in a strategy team with McKinsey. And then with our daughter of three and the, the twin boys of six months, we moved to Damascus in Syria, where I was engineering manager for the Al Farat Petroleum Company, a joint venture between Shell and the Syrian Petroleum Company. Um, the production was increasing rapidly, lots of new fields being developed on the border with Iraq, um, a beautiful country, lovely people. Um, and after being there for about three years, we moved back to the Netherlands, where I worked in finance, um, bringing together procurement activities into a centralized group. And then I became the CIO of Shell's global digital and IT business at a time of immense growth in IT. Um, we then moved back to Brunei, um, and I was country chairman and managing director, um, one of Shell's largest oil and gas producing countries um, and a highly significant role. Um, I was meant to be there for four years, but um, the government asked if I'd stay another two years. And after six years, the government said, would I stay longer? But um, by then our children were all back at school in the UK. It's a 28 hour flight door to door. Although they loved coming out to Brunei, they were a long way from us. And um, also I'd really done everything I think I could do there. Things were running very well. So I decided it might be time to move on. And our CEO contacted me one day and he said, Graham, um, I've got this group in London called Shipping and I don't know what to do with it. Um, it seems important, um, but at the same time, a lot of other um, oil and gas companies are doing all sorts of things with their shipping group. And what about if you came to London, um, you did a strategy piece of work and, and I'll come over from The Hague and, and go through it with you and we'll take it from there. So I said yes, um, and I came back to London and uh, did this piece of work and our CEO flew over uh, one morning, um, spent the whole morning with me actually. And I said to him, look, this is strategically competitive edge for Shell. Why? Because everything and everything that Shell does is on the water. Um, and not only that, it's a floating future too. So instead of just shipping, why don't we make it shipping a maritime? And we bring all of those activities in. So whatever it is that floats, and as you said, 2,000 floating assets, all the ships barging, offshore support vessels, floating production, mobile drilling rigs, bring everything in, centralize the expertise, we get the oversight of the billions, and I mean it is many you know, billions of dollars of spend, make the business more efficient um, and address the areas of underperformance of which one was safety. Um, he, he liked it. Um, he said, would I actually take it to the board, the Royal Dutch Shell board, which I did do. And um, he then said to me, would I, would I lead this change? Um, and uh, I certainly like a challenge. So I took this on. And um, I actually worked in that group, um, as, as you know, for 10 years in the end. And um, it was a, a fabulous, fabulous job. And, um, you know, we really, really moved, moved that whole shipping and maritime group forward within Shell. Absolutely. Well, you know, Graham, what I wanted to say is that uh, people who are involved in the maritime area are by nature very global, very cosmopolitan. But I hope... Uh, our listeners realize when we hear about your career path, how unique it is in <laughs> terms of the geographic diversity, but also in terms of the assignment diversity that you have gone through during your, uh, your career. So it is amazing and, and unique. But you've been with Shell for 40 years. You pioneered exactly this shipping and maritime. Uh, 
sector area within Shell. How do you see the fact um, of working for one company as an advantage? Which I'm sure it is. Um, well, actually, I, I don't see it as working for one company. Um, in fact, I've worked for many different companies, and I can tell you they're all very, very different. Um, even the difference between working in the UK and the Netherlands, um, let alone working um, with Brunei, Nigeria, Syria, um, different in terms of how they operate, how they, they, they run their businesses. Um, plus also, as you quite rightly said, Nicholas, the different roles, um, the challenges, the different culture, um, the external relationships, the country issues. Um, and also, I think there's no doubt that in any other company, I could not have had the, 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 the variety of roles. It's a bit of a thing when you, if you are moving to a, a very senior management position in Shell, that um, they will give you different opportunities in different parts of the business. But to think that you know, I started in engineering and operations and I worked in an IT group in finance um, back into into running a, a big, big global business and then heading up. I mean, it seems ridiculous, the global shipping and maritime operation. But what I'm, I'm able to contribute because of this range of experiences and, and the different roles and the different cultures, I'm able to, I think, contribute um, maybe some, some fresh perspectives and insights, um, use some of the techniques and some of the thinking from one area of the business to address the challenges in another. And also, I think it's given me um, the confidence to, to take up a challenge and deliver the changes, um, even um, against um, some you know, particularly strong headwinds. You're, you're very right. And I think uh, it, it's exactly what you described. It, it's not one company. It's so many yeah. countries, so many regions, so many assignments, uh, an amazingly compact and comprehensive career. But now let's focus on uh, on on today. Uh, you just opened the subject. You have been an ardent proponent, and you have not been frightened to take on major issues in shipping, such as decarbonization, digitalization, and safety. So each one of these themes is an area of critical significance for the industry, and I would say for global commerce. So how do you see this? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, they are major issues. And yet at the same time, Nicholas, we have to run the day-to-day -day operation. And, and it's a significant operation. I well, well know that. Um, the challenges are, are immense of, of moving a, a ship um, or a barge from one location to another and all of the, 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 the requirements that have to be put in place. Um, so we have to do that whilst we're managing these changes at the same time. Very interestingly, um, I don't actually see them as three separate subjects, and, I, and I, I suspect you don't either. And what I see is them as one subject. And I see very strongly it's not decarbonization and sort of over there safety, but it's deeper carbonization and safety very strongly together. I see them as one subject enabled by digitalization. So they need, these need to be taken forwards at the same time. Otherwise, you're going to get a suboptimal solution in, in any of the spaces. So it does concern me, actually, Nicholas, and we can come on to this, that when I see a lot of the conferences, um, uh, although I know Capital Link has, has, has actually been, been rather different in some areas, but with, I see a lot of conferences, a lot of discussions, a lot of debates. When I look at the shipping media, as I do every day, um, it concerns me that it's all about decarbonization. The subject of safety seems to not be so featured so prominently these days. Um, and I'm actually saddened to say that the only time it is featured is when there's a major incident. And I think this needs to change. And one thing I am hoping from this discussion that we're having today is that um, the media and, 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 and others see this and, and can understand this. Um, and that this today becomes a catalyst for a change of bringing together decarbonization and safety enabled by digitalization. Perfect. Uh, Graham, I couldn't agree with you more. 
and we are going to devote a good portion of our discussion later on on, on safety. By the way, I'm gratified to uh, to mention that the Capital Link has a unique conference, and you have been a great part of it. Yeah. That exactly brings together decarbonization, digitalization, and safety under the umbrella operational excellence in shipping. And in the last conference, you were the one spearheading the safety portion of it. Uh, so uh, again, thank you for your tremendous uh, help and support. Now let's devote a little bit of time to the various issues one by one. And uh, if you don't mind, let me start with decarbonization since it was the first one we mentioned. When it comes to decarbonization, we have in my mind three major topics, the fuels of the future, who regulates what, uh, this transition and how to pay for it. So let me start with the fuels of the future. We have seen Shell making a big push on LNG as a bunker in fuel, not just as a short-term solution, but maybe as a permanent one. So how do you see LNG in the future? Yeah, well, as, as you know, from day one, several years ago, um, uh, I was a, a major um, supporter of, of LNG at the very start of the decarbonization debate um, because it became very clear um, that with regard to decarbonizing, it, it is a, an immense challenge for the world, an immense challenge for shipping. Um, some areas, uh, some industrial areas are relatively, and I use that word very carefully, <laughs> relatively easier to um, decarbonize than others, but certainly shipping is in the difficult to do category. Um, we must also be careful when we see in the shipping media various announcements about um, particular fuels and companies who will be adopting particular fuels. Um, I think at this point in time, it's impossible to say um, which fuel will win through um, because all of those fuels have immense challenges. Um, and remember, many of them rely on hydrocarbons for their production. So what's important is that we work together, and we'll cover this hopefully a little bit later, we work together as one global team regarding decarbonization. But in the meantime, we should do the very best we should do. Um, we, we're not, nobody actually wants to sit back. Everybody's um, very, very supportive of decarbonization. Um, so whilst we are, are undertaking this work, and I mean, as I said, it's an immense amount of work, um, we should use LNG. It's a proven um, fuel. Um, it is proven to be the lowest um, carbon emitting fuel. Um, together with LNG, we can apply straightforward technology that is available today to reduce fuel usage. And if we reduce the fuel usage, we reduce the emissions. And combined with LNG, it's possible to achieve a carbon emissions reduction of 60% against the IMO baseline of 2008. And we can do that now. And Shell um, has, has, um, has ships that are coming onto charter, which are achieving that 60% reduction. And we simply must take that opportunity to do the best we can now. Um, in the future, um, with new technology, and also potentially with technologies such as carbon capture, it will be possible to get that 60% up, um, even maybe up to 100% or close to 100% carbon reduction. And remember the advantages of LNG. It's abundant in the world. It's there, we can use it. It's available and it's affordable. And we've actually been working with it for 50 years or more. So, we must do the very best we can do and I re uh, over the coming years, and certainly LNG is the key to that. Graham, we've been working together on so many topics and so many conferences, but uh, I would like to mention two in particular, the uh, decarbonization in shipping uh, that we started this year, and you were the chairman of the advisory committee, and then the operational excellence in shipping, where you were a, a critical and, and, and key uh, part of it. In both of those, uh, I was struck by your, uh, the line that you adopted, moving from discussion to delivery. And it's exactly <laughs> what you mentioned before. So when we open it up a little bit and we talk about the developing fuels issues, we have already in the media and heard in the various debates at the conferences, 
a lot of discussion. So how do you see the fuels developing in the future? How do we move from discussion to delivery? Um, I think the discussion is, is important. The debate is very important. And that discussion debate needs to include all of the stakeholders so that everyone feels ownership in the way forward. Um, what I do see is that there could be a variety of fuels that are used in the future. There are different um, requirements. So for example, two extremes, one is a ferry maybe operating from point A to point B and back to point A over a relatively short distance. You know, at, port, port, at point A or point B, you know, there can be a fuel, um, but that's very different from where you've got a tanker say, which is operating globally over vast distances, going into many, many ports. Um, and that fuel isn't just available in one point, but available at all fuels, fuel uh, locations. So you need a global infrastructure. And what we need to understand is that that global infrastructure of available fuels, um, we, we can't provide that as, as shipping, we, we, we can't produce those fuel, all that, that fuel that's needed in all those locations, store it and provide it. We are relying on other businesses to do that. So it's not about shipping alone. This is about shipping coming along with other industrial sectors so that uh, we, we use fuels that are available through those other industrial sectors. So there's two key areas here. One is, as I mentioned, the cost of all this infrastructure. Um, also the cost of new ships, but also the time it will take. Um, and we need to, to, to be able to use that time well. Um, we need to fully understand and fully study those new fuels with all of the groups involved, um, all our, understand all the aspects on an end-to-end -end basis. Um, there are many factors to understand, um, and not least where the new fuel comes from. As I said, many are produced from hydrocarbons. Um, and we need to undertake this piece of work in the global shipping community. Um, it's a global problem, um, and we need to make sure that we have the time to make the best decisions so that when we move forward, and it's, um, you know, it's important steps forward, that um, we make um, the decisions and we don't have to keep going back on them. Thank you. So moving forward, uh, there are so many stakeholders involved in the decarbonization process, possibly with conflicting agendas or priorities and potentially leading to a multitude of regional or national regulations. Is there a way to achieve an international mandate? Yeah, I, I believe there should be one global group to take decarbonization agenda forward, um, allowing for the debate. So yes, allowing for the discussion, not, not, not um, pushing it back or pushing it down, allowing everyone to align um, around the world in all the various groups. Um, noting my earlier point about there could be different solutions um, for different parts of, of shipping. Um, Having regional groups, um, I think, uh, results in, in things slowing down, a disjointed approach. And I think it's going to be extremely difficult to operate from one region to another if different decisions, different regulations exist within those, um, within those groups. Um, I'm not in any way suggesting to slow down um, at all. But what I'm saying is, we, it's one of those subjects, and we often see them in life, where in order to move fast, you need to move a little bit slower at the beginning. And I think, um, whilst I'm not saying to slow down, we need to move, as I said, at the right place, get that global working, um, potentially with the IMO, get separate work streams working to cover all of the aspects, involve all of the groups, and involve an aligned way forward that everyone can buy into within uh, global shipping. But that leads me to the next question. Do you think that the shipping industry today has an effective and unified way to make its voice heard on issues like decarbonization and new fuels? And, and what can be done to improve in this area, especially when interacting with the regulators and aiming to achieve an international mandate that you described? Yeah, um, I don't think that 
that we have that unified approach at, at the moment. Um, there's a lot of extremely good work which is taking place. Um, I think the shipping industry is, is united um, regarding the need to decarbonize. Um, I think everyone understands um, there is a need for change. They understand the urgency. Um, however, there are many, many aspects to consider. And as I said, give um, time for the various groups um, to develop that unified approach that you talk about. Um, we're not just talking here about shipping. We are talking about uh, other industries. Um, we're talking about different locations around the world. We're talking about governments too. Um, so th there are groups that have been formed. Um, as I said, they're undertaking useful work. Um, but I, I think that the way to move forward um, is to form a group um, which I'll, I'm calling together in decarbonization. Now, we're going to talk a little bit later about the work on safety, um, and we can align the thinking, the ways of working that we have put in place for together in safety with together in decarbonisation. It's proven ways of working. We're involving all the parties. It's a unified approach. Um, we've taken the time to get everything in place. Um, this together in decarbonisation group can um, work with the IMO and with others. Um, and we need to understand on regulation, I know the IMO is very supportive of this because I have discussed it with them, that not everything needs to be regulated. And, and knowing what needs to be regulated and what the shipping industry can, can do itself um, is, is something which, um, which I, I, I think we need, to, we need to also understand. Now, I'd be very happy to help in um, developing together in decarbonisation if there's an appetite for it. And I think that that would solve all of the issues. You actually answered, Graham, my next question. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, what you're talking about uh, to do in decarbonization, you're realizing it in safety with the coalition. And exactly my question was, uh, all these initiatives from charters, financiers and other stakeholders they're wonderful, I think, but they lead to fragmentation of effort as opposed to what you described as consolidation of the effort to have a more unified and impactful approach. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's the ship owners who are called to implement those decisions, whatever they are, uh, and, and live by them on a day-by-day -day basis uh, or for the long term when they put uh, you know, fleet renewal orders. Uh, so I don't know if you have anything more to add on that, or I should move on to the next. Uh... Well, the, the only one point I would add, and totally agree with you, I mean, there's been some excellent initiatives, um, very hard work to get them in place. But what we're missing, and this is where Together in Decarbonisation can come in, is an overarching strategy. This is what we have in safety now. Everyone understands it. So it's in everyone's you know, language. They feel a part of it. They own it. It's aligned with, um, with other industries. Um, with that strategy, an implementation plan, a roadmap, um, with a realistic timeline. And then everyone will know where they fit in with that strategy, where they fit in with the roadmap and timeline, and what they need to do to deliver their part of the strategy. That's a brilliant idea. I hope it works. Uh, you know, unifying efforts, unity in strength. Rather, sorry, strength in unity. Yes. Strength yes. in unity. Uh, <laughs> I got it the other way around. So <laughs> we talked at the beginning about uh, decarbonization, digitalization, and safety being three components of the same package. So now let me go to, to digitalization and technology, and then we'll go to safety. So technology spans across all areas of shipping operations. And I'd like to ask you, you have gone through so many uh, areas of operations yourself. You, you worked on technology. Can you share with us which are the areas that you consider to be the most affected by digitalization and where can we expect more progress or changes looking ahead? Yeah, um, so what's important um, is is data in all of this. I remember working for um, a boss um, many years ago, and um, I remember he, he said to me, data is king. Um, <laughs> uh, data is king. 
Um, but what's important is knowing what data to collect. Um, and when we, we started some of this work on digitalization um, in Shell uh, several years ago, um, one of the groups that I contacted was a relationship which Shell has had for many, many years, which is with Ferrari, Ferrari cars. Um, and we had several meetings with them. Um, one of the things that I, I really picked up from them is that a Ferrari car is actually a data machine. It's going around the track. Um, it is pumping out many, many, many hundreds, thousands of data points a second. It's being collected in, a, in an operations center. And then with that data, they're making changes to the setting on the vehicle and, and also um, collaborating with the driver. Um, and when you look at that, one of the key things they said was, we can, we can collect loads and loads of data, but what's important is knowing what data to collect. And I think that's what's important. And um, one of the things that, that we've tried to do in the digitalization work that we did in Shell was to understand what is the problem, what is the issue, and what data will solve that problem and that issue. So not data for the sake of data. And, and I think that, that that is an important driver in moving forward with digitalization. Um, I think that there are, there's a lot of good work going on in Shell and many other companies um, have already put in place operation centers. So um, in this way, um, you can manage the ship's passage through the ocean such that um, you route it um, to favorable weather conditions and around storms. You can, um, you, you can adjust speed of the ship so it arrives in time to go directly into port, not wait at an anchorage and, and directly to a berth. Um, and by doing this, you will uh, reduce the amount of fuel that it uses and therefore reduce the amount of emissions. But at the same time, and this is my link with safety, the ship will then be weather routed um, through uh, more comfortable areas, shall I say. And also when it comes into port, it will go through ports where it won't have to go to anchor. It won't have to go through heavily congested waters, um, which is where quite a lot of the accidents take place. So you see this integration, this knowing what data to collect, this integration of decarbonization and safety. Um, and I think what we can see more into the future is much more of the integration of these technologies. Um, whether it's weather routing, whether it's um, optimizing uh, passage into ports, um, technologies around um, reducing the, um, the, the drag on the ship, uh, wind technology, things like this. But the integration of these technologies together, right the way through the design and the construction and through to the operation, so that the carbon emissions at their lowest possible level on an end-to-end -end basis and the safety performance um, is improved at the same time. Very interesting. So now let's move to, uh, to safety. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, today you are the CEO of Together in Safety, a non-regulatory coalition of major shipping industry groups and companies working to improve the safety performance in global shipping to prevent major uh, shipping incidents uh, and save lives. Shipping is one of the most hazardous industries in the world. And together in safety provides the opportunity to dramatically improve the safety performance across every shipping sector. So before I ask you about the coalition, you are considered to be the industry spokesperson on safety. Can I ask you if you can explain to us more about what safety means to you and why? I always think that, but by luck, um, I could be on one of those ships um, as a seafarer. Um, and we've got to remember that on those ships, um, it not only could be us, but it could be one of our brothers, one of our sisters, um, one of our sons and daughters. And um, in being on one of those ships, I asked myself, what would I expect the leaders, myself and people listening to this, what do I expect those leaders to be doing? Um, and if I look at shipping, um, I see three reasons why safety is so, so important. And I've called them the, uh, the statistical reason, the business reason, and then something that I call the real reason. And I'll just touch upon these. So firstly, starting with the statistical reason. And as you say, 
Shipping is one, has one of the worst safety performances of any industry in the world. A UK study showed that you're five times more likely to have a fatal accident on a ship than in construction. If you look at the suicide rate, if you take um, suspicious cases, it could be up to 18 times worse than the suicide rate in the general UK population. And every seven days, every week, a ship is lost. That means sunk. These are terrible statistics. And for the statistics alone, it's got to be a clear reason why we need to do something. Now let's look at the business reason. Shipping incidents result in high cost to the industry. Um, you can see that if you look in the press in the last couple of days or so, the dramatic increases in insurance premiums that have been taking place year on year and into the future. And these will continue. And these are the real costs. But what about the intangible costs? If you have an accident, the costs on management time, the fact that the ship um, will, be, will be under investigation for long periods and not available, maybe needs repairs. Um, things like the reputation of the company, um, the reputation of the CEO. Um, but if you turn this around um, and you have a great safety performance and you show you care for the crew, um, then they will be highly motivated to do a great job for you and want to perform well for the company, and they'll speak highly of the company. So if you look at the statistical and the business reasons, they're clear. Um, but then I come on to what I call the real reason. And um, as, as you mentioned, and, and I said, I've worked around the world in many places. And I've seen, Nicholas, some, um, some terrible, terrible accidents. Um, people killed in horrific circumstances. And I've seen firsthand um, what is left behind with young mothers and small children, no father, no prospects. Um, and this doesn't just last a day or a week or a year, but a lifetime and more. And, and I can tell you, time never heals. Safety is one of the most important things in our life, our personal safety, our personal well-being, the safety and well-being of our family and children. And our seafarers are people too. They're people like you and they're people like me. And they have a family and children too. And these seafarers work for us. They entrusted their safety in us. And we're accountable for that safety. So we need to look after them as if they were our family and our children. And I hope that everyone listening is convinced um, by both individually the statistical reason and the business reason, but also this real reason. Um, so that's why safety is my number one priority, um, and it should be for everyone. And it's very clearly been demonstrated, and I've demonstrated in the places I've worked, that a safe business is a well-run business and a profitable business too. You have made such a uniquely compelling case for this, obviously. So I think there's nothing more to be said in terms of why shipping companies should adopt a more aggressive role in the future when it comes to safety. Um, you elaborated in, in detail as to the many reasons why and to the benefits. I don't know if you would like to add anything, anything more before we go into the uh, role and the function of the Together in Safety Coalition. And if you can tell us how it started, how it yeah. is today and, and what's next on the agenda. Yeah, well, just before I get there, let me say that um, there are many shipping companies um, who share my thinking on safety. Um, and certainly in the coalition, um, that is true, and it goes beyond that. And also, there are many shipping companies who have made great improvements in, in their performance. Um, but it's not universal. Um, and what we need to do is get this understanding of the reasons and also work with those other companies um, to help them to, to, to actually move um, their safety performance. And, and within Together in Safety, and I'll explain a little bit more in a moment, but within Together in Safety, what we've been developing is, is best practices. So these are demonstrated ways in which an improvement can be made. They're free of charge, so companies don't have to generate their own um, uh, methods. They can use these and therefore go straight into implementation and straight into verification, because verification is important too. 
Um, it's no point in just issuing this stuff to the ship or telling the ship, ship this or that. Um, you need to verify that what you think is happening is actually happening in practice. Um, but moving on to together in safety, so shipping as many um, important and influential groups, many ship owners, many managers, many related supporting businesses, as we know. But what became clear when I was speaking to them um, about safety is that something else needed to be done, something that would bring these various groups together, um, something that would unite the shipping industry around safety and draw on their collective expertise. And so about two years ago, um, Together in Safety was born. Um, Together in Safety is unique. Um, it comprises all of the shipping industry groups. So it includes, for example, the International Chamber of Shipping, BIMCO, OKIMF, Intertanko, Intercargo, Interferry, Cruise Liners International, the World Shipping Council, many major shipping companies, Carnival, Euronav, Gaslog, Maersk, MSC, Shell, V-Ships, UK p &I Club, Lloyd's Register, and country representation as well through the Danish Maritime Council and the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. We've also established links with the IATA, the International Air Transport Association, and the RSSB, the UK Rail Standards and Safety Board, so we can learn from them. What we've done is developed a, a strategy, and I talked about the importance of a strategy, around three core themes of leadership, incident prevention, and well-being and care, and with a key focus on collaboration and working together with all of those stakeholders and with other industries as well. It is very interesting, uh, and, and thank you for taking us through this. It's exactly you put together uh, a coalition that works with every major industry group. Yep. It's exactly what we talked before, uh, strength and unity, because it gives you the opportunity to be the spokesperson and the uh, coalition spearheading this uh, issue. Hmm. So let me go to the next uh, uh, question. The industry and charters want newer and safer ships. At the same time, as we have seen, there's uncertainty on fuels and, and engines, uncertainty which impedes or complicates their fleet renewal. Our ship owners do not know what to invest regarding the ship and the technology and so on. And ships are long-term assets, so fleet renewal is a very important topic. How does, the, how does this uh, reluctance or ambiguity regarding fleet renewal impact safety? Um, safety is not about a newer ship. Very few incidents actually result um, regarding the, the ship itself, providing that it's well-maintained. Um, it comes down to the areas that I highlighted and are part of Together in Safety, um, which are around uh, leadership, around incident prevention and well-being and care. Now, if we just look at these, so leadership is vital. What the CEO asks for is what gets done. Everyone listens to what the CEO says and what the CEO doesn't say. Everyone is watching. They're watching what the CEO does and what the CEO doesn't do. So the CEO must show that visible leadership, starting every conversation with safety. People will know when they speak to me, I start every conversation with safety. Visiting people on the front line. I would visit our ships, visit our people. You need to show you're leading the safety program. You're reviewing progress. And you're being curious and asking questions about why do people do what they do and you make time for safety. Incident prevention is around understanding the major incident types and proactively putting in place programs to address them before they happen. And this has been a major breakthrough in, in air, um, understanding their major incident types. And there are not 100, there are not 50, there are not even 20. We are talking about a fairly small number and then putting in place proven techniques to stop them happening before they happen. And then finally, well-being and care, about looking after your seafarers, um, looking after them as if they were your own family, listening to them, addressing their concerns, motivating them to do a great job for you.
So you'll notice, um, Nicholas, that none of these areas is around a new ship. And we also know that there are plenty of old aircraft out there that we happily fly on. So um, I think that um, this, this whole thing about a new ship, um, uh, we, 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 we can continue, as I said, and make sure we take the time, not slow down, we take the necessary time in this decarbonisation space as well to make the right decisions, get everyone working together, and we'll actually work quicker as a result of that, and working decarbonisation and safety together with the enablement of digitalization. Graham, thank you so much for this uh, spot on reply, because as you very correctly and well pointed out, safety doesn't have to do just with new ships. And uh, you know, the world fleet today is not composed only of new ships. We have uh, ships of various ages uh, and safety is something that should apply universally across the board. And you're so right that at the end of the day, it's the CEO sitting on top of the organization who is going to instill the company culture to be followed around safety, around governance, about everything. So thank you for, uh, for really honing into this in such a, an explicit way. Now, let me uh, go to the next uh, question. The world now is coming slowly out of the pandemic. Or to put it differently, we have found ways to minimize its impact and live with it. So how do you see the world and shipping developing in this new era we're heading to? Well, I am very positive um, about the future of shipping. Um, I'm very positive um, that we can tackle the challenges ahead um, and the issues. Um, I think that, um, as I have found, um, in the times of challenge, um, you're often at your best. And also, we can make the shipping industry stronger, come out stronger. Um, and also, I think it will allow us to, to have the voice that we deserve and, and we need in the world. Um, the world is moving forward, propelled by technology, and I think shipping can benefit from this by grasping the opportunities um, with enthusiasm. Um, I think that what we are seeing is the world is, um, has, has woken up to the fact that shipping is vital for the world to function. And we have the opportunity to be at the forefront of this positive movement. Thank you. And we are now coming to close to the end of our, of our discussion. I wanted to ask on a more personal basis, you've been on top of a major global charting and shipping organization. You have always been on the go. I mean, you have worked in so many places around the world and that you have been continuously on the move 24 seven. Of course, now the pandemic has changed this temporarily, but as I mentioned, we're coming out of it. So how do you balance between work and personal life and, and what is next on your agenda? Well, firstly, I, I love my job. <laughs> I don't see, I think you're the same, Nicholas. <laughs> I, I don't see my job as work. Um, uh, and what I, I don't have a set pattern of work. I know you don't either. Um, I, I don't say I start at this time and I finish at that time. And I blend it together, but also I make sure we have um, family time and, and what I call me time as well. And um, Part of me time is actually keeping fit. So I run about seven or eight kilometers a day. I've been out running this morning. I go in the gym. Um, not only do I find this helps keep my mind clear, um, but also um, I do my best thinking when I'm running, actually. And I often set myself a particular challenge, a dilemma or a problem and, uh, when I'm outside running and, and my mind uh, can, work, uh, can work best. Um, I'm also very efficient. I know that. My wife says to me that I am the most efficient person that she's ever met. Um, and I plan meticulously. Uh, so I find that way. Uh, I don't waste a lot of time and therefore I, I can make time, so to speak. Finally, um, I have a wonderful wife um, and children. We set out on an adventure together Um Years ago, uh, my wife has always said yes to every opportunity. And um, I think we've demonstrated that working together um, is the best way forward. 
Um, so what next? Um, well, I want to continue with my passion for safety, um, partly because it is an area that I want to give back on. Um, I'm, I've got a lot of colleagues in the shipping industry um, who I'm working with, and all of us want to make a difference. Um, we want to give back um, the gift of life. Um, we want to make the changes that are necessary to turn around that statistical performance um, and, and make sure that we get the positives out of it um, in the shipping industry. Wonderful, thank you very much. So last question to ask you, after building such a successful career and unique career, reflecting back, what advice would you give to a younger self, your younger self, and is there anything you would have done differently? Um, I've been immensely fortunate in so many ways, immensely fortunate. Um, I could well have um, followed my father's tailored, tailor's business, I, uh, I suppose. Um, but I, you know, people helped me. Um, a teacher helped me. And um, I've had many people help me um, throughout. Um, I've been very fortunate. And when I look back, um, I can't think of anything I, I would have changed. Um, even some of those very, very challenging times and those challenging environments and circumstances. And, you know, you could hear we, you know, we had an eight week old baby, we had this, we had that, um, but, but we stuck to it together. And I think that those challenging times and those challenging environments have actually made me a better person. Um, they made me much more grateful of what I've got and shaped um, the way in which I think. So. The one thing I, I would say advice to my younger self is not to um, not to shy away from challenges, but to pick up those challenges um, and and really, really um, take them as areas where where you can grow. Um, I have realized that I can make a difference in this world for our seafarers and their families. Um, and as I say, there are a lot of colleagues and friends that I've made in the shipping industry um, who want to work with me and I want to work with them. And um, we're going to make a difference. Graham, I'd like, uh, before I ask you for your closing remarks, I'd like to say that it has been a tremendous privilege to, uh, to have you uh, with this uh, insightful uh, discussion. I'd like to thank uh, the UK PNI Club and Thomas Miller who are sponsoring this podcast today and who are also big supporters of the coalition for their support of the industry and for the sponsorship of this podcast. And I'd like to take a moment to, uh, to thank you, not only for what you're doing for the industry, but I have to say I have been the beneficiary of uh, so many times we have interacted and I have experienced not only your ability to look at the broader strategic issues, but I have been always impressed, immensely impressed, by your attention to detail. You undertake something, you hone into it, you get it done, and no detail is a, is a minor detail to be overlooked. So I would like to thank you for the support you have given besides the industry, also to Capital Link. It's been a privilege to uh, interact with you. And uh, anything we can do, of course, from our end to support the coalition and safety, we would be happy to do. So let's have some closing remarks uh, before thanking you for uh, once more for this podcast. Well, thank you, Nicholas. And as I said at the beginning, it's been, um, you know, I've been, I was very, feel very privileged to be asked to be part of this because uh, I know it's a very prestigious group of people. Um, but but I think, you know, it's just some one of touching on one or two of the key points. So firstly, um, you know, it's not um, decarbonization with safety as a separate subject and digitalization technology, but it is one subject enabled by technology. And I think we need to really drive that forward. Um, it's not one or the other. And we need collaboration within um, the shipping industry on a scale that we've never seen before and also with other industries. Um, for decarbonization, we need to establish that global strategy and an implementation plan with a realistic timeline. Um, and I think and I hope that everyone has seen how fundamental safety is to everything that we do. And I do hope that the decarbonization work can align with that great work that we've um, been able to achieve in Together in Safety. 
Um, working together as leaders in the shipping industry, um, we have the power to make um, the changes that are necessary. And I know that together we can improve the safety performance for every company, for every ship, and to ensure that our seafarers get home safely to their families. And I'd just like to close by saying that we need to be able to say to every family member of every seafarer that your father, your mother, your son, your daughter is working on one of our ships and it is the safest place on earth. Thank you. What a wonderful way to close. Thank you, Graham, so much again. It's been a privilege to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. you.